Shit. Yes? I told you not to hang up on me. What do you want? To talk. Well, dial someone else, okay? Listen, asshole! No, you listen, you little bitch! You hang up on me again, I'll cut you like a fish, understand? <sighs> yeah. Is this some kind of joke? More of a game, really. Can you handle that? Blondie. It is the Scream series. What's your favorite scary movie? That whole thing. You sound so dismissive of it. Like, ah, oh, just that movie. Didn't even have its own thing. It just stole from a bunch of other movies and made its own thing, right? Like, that's what it did. tarantino the horror genre. Isn't that kind of what it did? Sort of. I think it has a lot of unique properties to it, though. Sure. But the only downside of this whole franchise is that it made people speak in pop culture terms. Everything is pop culture speak now. Ma very much made it popular, though. Would you agree yeah. with that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm Aaron Peterson. This is Amanda Sink. Hello, hello. <laughs> if you're wondering why we're talking about Scream, it's because it's a 25th anniversary this year. And also, why not? Why the heck not? First question, Amanda, before we get into this whole movie and this franchise, because I want to go through each one of these damn movies. Oh, okay. I want to know what's your favorite scary movie. Or what's your favorite scary movie? You know, that whole thing. Well. I can't do it without thinking of scary movie, honestly. <laughs> I, I mean, Scream doesn't scare me at all. And are you asking in general what's my favorite scary movie or yeah. my favorite Scream movie? No, no. What's your favorite scary movie? I would assume your favorite Scream movie is Scream. Yes. Okay. Uh, and it, that's also probably my favorite scary movie. It's not one that scares me, though. So I feel like this is a... Uh, I don't know. I feel like I'm answering incorrectly because there's only ever been really one movie that scared me and I talked about it on the regular Hollywood Outsider podcast before but Nightmare on Elm Street used to terrify the living shit out of me until I saw the remake and then somehow that just was like nah <laughs> you have nothing to be scared of <laughs> yeah, yeah sucked it all out yeah I get it wow was Jackie really that bad poor guy <laughs> <laughs> I mine is Jaws, so you know I, I think that's oh, pretty yeah. generic, but it's true. That's not yeah. generic. For a lot of people, it's like, oh, that's the best you can. Well, I could come up with some really arty indie thing that you've never heard of. Sure, pull that out of my ass, but that wouldn't be the truth. It's Jaws, because that's the only movie that's ever really scared me shitless. Also, if somebody dismissed Jaws, I'd be like, do you not understand oh, all have. of the contributions that that film made to cinema history? You little douche. <laughs> you little douches. Some people love to be that uh, contrarian thing. If it's popular, you know, they don't like it. And you can't reference it. You got to reference something cool and culty. Yeah. Sure. Because that makes you cool. It does. I think some people think it makes you cool. <sighs> Look, we at the Hollywood Outsider, we're not here to judge anybody's preferences. If you're Fuck favorite... you, I will judge you silly, but it will make sense. <laughs> Judging but, people who love Jaws okay, okay. doesn't make sense. If you love Darren Aronofsky, I will judge you. I will. It's but just we're still going to accept you. We're just going to tell you that you're wrong. Uh, I feel like that's different. I mean, I'll accept you, but I don't want to go to the movies with you anymore. <laughs> just kidding. Okay, Not I guess really. the rest of us are a little nicer than Aaron. <laughs> the Fountain might be the, my favorite horror movie. Scared the shit out of me. Oh, God. All right. Well, you know what? Scream. Scream is a great movie. We should probably talk about that. And then the 47 movies that followed it. Uh, a year after her mother's death, Sydney Prescott, it's played by Nev Campbell, and her friends started experiencing some strange phone calls. They later learned the calls were coming from a crazed serial killer or two in a white face mask and a large black robe. No, it's ghost face. He's looking for revenge. For what? For why? We don't know. But his phone calls consist mainly of questions. The main one being, what's your favorite scary movie? And, of course... That led to lots of people being murdered in the small town of Woodsboro. Now, we come to find out in that first movie that... Oh, spoiler alert. <laughs> if you haven't uh, seen I think 25 years is plenty time for you to catch up. And if you haven't seen Scream, you should just pause right now, go watch it, and then come back. Because I'm going to give you a lot of trivia that's going to spoil the shit out of this whole movie. No, I, we're just going to wait. Go ahead, go watch it. We'll wait. Go ahead. 
<laughs> anyway, we found out it wasn't one, but two killers. Two killers. Now, while that was a really novel concept and it was cool as hell because it really took us by surprise when that first one came out, they kind of beat that horse to death in the next movies. <laughs> a little really bit. Did. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Because then it was just like two killers in every movie, every movie but one. So that's a little much. I mean, really, it's hard to find somebody who can keep a secret about what you did on Friday night, let alone all the murders you just pulled. So I really have a hard time thinking it happened three times minimum. Just saying. Yeah, I don't know what's up with this area, but they seem to have a lot of impact on group murderers. <laughs> they say, That's not very common in the nation, but in Woodsboro, that is extremely common. So be wary of cliche or cliches, yeah. clicks. Yeah, cliches, too. I mean, by the fourth movie, or I that, think yeah. you're heavily steeped in some cliches. <laughs> All right, Amanda, you get trivia this time. I don't I don't want to do any trivia. So you you bring it up. Okay. This is like one of your favorite movies. Go. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So originally, I feel like, Aaron, you're going to know all of these, but just tell me if something I already did. I'm going to go take a nap. You let me know when you're done. I'll come back. <laughs> the original name of the movie was Scary Movie, and mm-hmm. it was changed halfway through the production of the film. Which is where the, the spoof came from. Right. Yeah. yeah. Those fun little parodies. Yeah. Where apparently we need dicks in every movie for some reason. I don't, I don't quite understand why that was a thing in Scary Movie, but there's a lot of dicks hanging out. <laughs> there is that too. Sorry. I just, I'm like, where, where does it, okay. What does this have to do with Scream? Ah, it's funny. Okay. Maybe is it though? <laughs> <laughs> Something that I think is interesting and a little, uh, makes it more terrifying is the voice actor for Ghostface. Um, was never allowed to see Drew. Drew and Roger were never able to interact with each other. So when she was talking on the phone to this creepy voice, that was somebody she had never met. And I feel like that makes it even more traumatizing for an actress and more scary because you really don't know who's on the other end of the phone. Hey, Casey. I don't know why. That's a really bad impression. I can't do ghost That was That was real rough. Hello, Casey. (laughs) <laughs> no, you better? need to That's get like very went with. <laughs> growly and like very deep in your sternum oh, yeah. or something. I just love how they uh, made all these voice, uh, re- whatever they are, transistors, whatever they are that recreate the voice. A voice that people use. thing. Thank you. A voice changer in the future movies. And they all got that voice perfectly accurate. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing that nobody's voice changes. It, they all sound the same. They all sound and- exactly like that dude. Yeah. Roger like Jackson. Roger. Miss Jackson, if you're nasty. <laughs> the set was, <laughs> especially for the Drew Barrymore scenes, was so terrorizing to other people nearby that they actually thought that someone was being murdered and terrorized. So police were actually called to the set. Oh, wow. I didn't know that one. Yeah. And how they managed to get Drew Barrymore to cry so incessantly when she's talking to Ghostface is she had shared a story with Wes, a really terrible one, about a dog being burned by the owner. And so if she was crying or he was trying to get her to cry, he'd say, I'm lighting the lighter to tap into her her fears and get those tears to come out, which I think is... Kind of mean, but also kind of great that they had that sort of relationship where she was willing to share it. I don't know if she consented to him using it, but. Interesting. There's a lot of stuff I don't know. See, you're informing me. You are welcome. (laughs) The MPAA actually limited the visual in a lot of scenes, but in the beginning where Steve's intestines were ripped out, they really, (laughs) Wes really wanted that to be visualized and. They cut a lot of it. They they had a lot of cutting to do in this film. <laughs> they sure did. Huh? <laughs> they cut Casey. They cut Nev. Yeah. They cut, you know, they cut Rose. They cut, they cut all of them. They did. They Sorry. did. Sorry. Woosa. So uh, I didn't like that excess. I, I honestly, I feel like every time you have extreme gore, it took me out of a screen movie. So when really? Wes actually had, yeah, those are the scenes I, I really don't. Like there's a couple of them in that movie, but that one, the one with uh, the gutted boyfriend, I think is too much because it's ridiculous. And you had me because I, I'm I'm involved, I'm invested because it felt like it was a very real thing. It was possible, but that moment took me out of it completely. Huh. 
I, I this is one of the few movies where I enjoy the the hints of extreme gore here and there and just some of the absurdity to the kills the uniqueness and the creativity like especially when rose mcgowan's character is murdered through the garage door <laughs> i think that and also that was inspired from a story so funny. where someone had a, a little dog door in their garage door and had told kevin who was the writer about it and he was like this is awesome i'm totally gonna put this in my movie and this is how she's gonna die oh wow so she her death was spawned from a a doggy death from a doggy door in somebody's garage, which is actually really smart. I would love to have a doggy door through the garage because then you don't have the, to worry did about the it. Dog die then? No, or? no, no, no. Oh, okay, it just there was a doggy door okay. there. That's better. That's a better fact. <laughs> the, the trivia makes more sense now. I was like, this is a horribly tragic. That's fucked up. Why would you put That's that in a two movie? Two dead dog stories in five minutes of the podcast. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a lot no, of no, dead no. dogs. And the the mask, the iconic ghost face mask, was actually just kind of happened upon when they were location scouting. It was there and they found it and it was easily replicated and they found it elsewhere. So they were like, hey, we'll just use this. They did want to originally have white, but Wes had decided that the black would be creepier. And so that's why, it, you know, for the cape part of it, if you will, they wanted to make sure that you couldn't identify who the killer was by their skin, you know, on their hands or the clothes they were wearing, different things like that. And that's why the boots were made to be something that anybody could just have on. And you saw a lot of people wearing some of these boots. So the only thing you could identify them with is the shoes because everything else was covered by this black outfit costume thing. Mm, Gotcha. One thing that is really impressive to me is... The really, really iconic opening of Scream where Drew Barrymore is running and she gets stabbed and we're all like, oh, my God, we thought she'd get away. That entire piece was done in one take. Hmm. So they gave it one good shot. Drew really nailed it and they used it. Can I tell you one thing that has always bothered me about that shot? What? You can you can tell the knife like turns to the side. Oh, can you? That's funny. Yeah. I haven't noticed that. If go, you will now. Every time, <laughs> you will you will see that it's a collapse, collapsible knife, obviously. But as it's starting to quote unquote go in, when you know the killer lunges in front of her and pulls it into her, it like goes to the side. So I mean, it doesn't really look like it's going in if you really if you really pay attention. Hmm. It's a stupid movie nerd thing of mine. I'm like, oh, but hey, this. that's better than using a real knife. Like some prop masters are using real guns and not checking to see if there's hey, bullets hey, hey. before they shoot let's them. Let's keep but... it. Let's keep it nice here. Let's not. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to go there. Uh uh-uh, uh. This is a happy podcast. None of that. That's tragedy. <laughs> don't want tragedy here. This okay. is about fake dead people. So I know you're gonna be. I know you really, really appreciate the question that it's the trivia that is happening between. Casey and Ghostface when he's Mm -hmm. asking her about um, horror movie trivia and he asks who the killer is. Mm -hmm. And that question was actually used by Kevin at some sort of like a trivia night and he won a free drink and that's why he used it and put it into the movie because it stumped the audience enough at a bar that he was like, oh, that's that's cool. We'll reuse it. What's funny is I I think most horror fans have used that to stump people up until Scream stole it and made it really popular. Absolutely. The whole, whole, who you know, who's the killer of Friday the 13th? And then people say, Jason. It's not. It's Jason's mom. But most genuine general people that don't have that savage need to watch horror movies like us, um, they didn't know that. They just assume it's Jason because that's the the face of the franchise. Mm Mm-hmm. Understandably so, but you know, it's not him. It's just yeah. a baby in the woods. And while they do steal a lot of things from other horror movies, or they do a lot of homage homages homage. to horror movies, especially Halloween, because and on Nightmare on Elm Street, obviously because of Wes Craven, they do a lot of breaking the cliches and trying to flip things on the horror movie cliches to say, okay, if you 
you have this woman who says, don't go running down the hallway or go, don't go running up the stairs, go out the front door. And she's a strong ass bitch. That is literally in my notes that she is a strong ass bitch in all capital letters. <laughs> it's also is like saying, OK, she's cognizant and aware of it enough that she knows not to do it. But what happens when something prevents her from being able to go out the front door or, you know, just some of those different things that make it they try to twist it a little bit and they present you with the killer in the very beginning and make it seem so obvious that you think, oh, there's no way it could be this guy when it totally is. It's just him and another guy. So uh, some fun I, trivia. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I, I like how in terms of, of Scream, I mean, yeah, a lot of it's pop culture and they really made that relevant people in the movie talking about movies. I think everyone that loves horror movies loved that. And I did like the nods to Nightmare on Elm Street and Friday the 13th and all the other horror movies that came before. Like, it was a very respectful horror film. You know what I mean? It just, it came yeah. out and it was just saying, we love horror movies and we're making a horror movie. We're making a slasher flick for people that love movies that we love. And that's, that's what made it great. Should I let the machine get it? Hello? Are you alone in the house? Bitch! You bitch! Where the fuck are you? Not so fast. We're gonna play a little game. It's called Guess Who Just Called the Police and Reporting You. Sorry, motherfucking ass! Find you, you dipshit! Get up! I can't, Billy. How you cut me too deep? I think I'm dying here, man. <laughs> Hello? Oh, Stu, Stu, Stu. What's your motive? Billy's got one. The police are on their way. What are you going to tell them? Peer pressure. I'm far too sensitive. I'm going to rip you up, you bitch! Just like your fucking mother! You've got to find me first, you pansy-ass mama's boy! Fuck! Ah, fucking hit me with a phone, dick! Fucker, where are you? Ah! Ah, you fuck! Ah! Did you really call the police? You missed your sorry ass, I did. My mom and dad are going to be so bad. Ah! Bitch! And speaking of homages to other horror movies, in the scene where the principal kind of opens up the door in the school and he looks out there and there's a janitor Sweater. out there just mopping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually Wes Craven wearing the original Freddy costume shirt from Nightmare on Elm Street, which I thought yeah. was really funny. That was really cool. That one I knew. I knew that one. So some interesting stuff about the house, which just seems super extra, but because it was written into the script, they had to find a way to make it a reality. And in the scene where you have Sydney in her bedroom and she's being chased by Ghostface and her bedroom door, she opens it but locks it with her closet door, the two kind of going back to back, so that way it would jam if the doors were open. They actually built a, an entire wall in the house to make it so that way there was a closet that would do that. Oh, wow. I didn't mm -hmm. know that. That's kind of cool. I, I think a lot of people have tried. I have tried that door trick, and it does not work. Because most houses aren't built house. like that. <laughs> no, but it was. it's really cool. I'm like, that's so smart. She was such a resourceful heroine. Absolutely. Definitely. Had to be. I mean, every every time she came back to Woodsboro, somebody tried to kill her. So that would suck. I'd never come back for the reunion. <laughs> I don't know why she doesn't just move far away and never talk to anybody again. Well, she did. And then she came back. And then she did. And then she but came that's why back. you got to just not come back. You just. She, she came back nope. twice after she moved away. Like, was it no, the forget that. third movie? You know, was it the third movie or the fourth movie? I think it was the third movie where she, we'll talk about it in a little bit, but where she moved into the country and she was like a 911 operator or whatever. And then she moved back and then she could finally leave the door open, that whole thing. I mean, just stay there. Like, hey, there's cops. They'll figure it out. Maybe. So one of the shots that I really liked and was apparently one of Wes's favorites is when they do the initial shot of the school, the news has just come out about Casey being murdered the cameraman was actually on a crane to do what a drone now would probably do and actually just stepped off of it during the shot. So it was one continuous shot of him just hopping off this crane, which I thought was kind of cool. And then it continues on to introduce some of our side characters, including Gail and and telling us about the murders. But what a 
a good, smooth transition of that scene. Oh, I think it's probably one of the the best filmed, uh, sla- well, I think it is the best filmed slasher flick ever. Yeah. Personally, I mean, it's just, it's lush. It it really <laughs> works. It's kind of timeless. I mean, it's 25 years old. I've seen it pretty much every Halloween or around these times, and it still holds up to this day. I mean, it's pretty timeless in that respect. And a lot of that had to do with Wes Craven and how he elected to use the camera. Yes. And a, yeah. and a score. I love the score of these films. So <laughs> I just, I do. Not just the music, not the soundtrack. I'm talking the actual score by um, Marco Beltrami. It's it's just really, I don't know, just kind of perfect. It just fits the mood. It's perfect. Yeah, incredibly talented guy. Mm-hmm. So this film was very controversial because of some of the things that they were trying to do. Not only just the visuals of like gutting high school students, but they were actually thrown out of the high school in Santa Rosa when the board had read the script about the dialogue on people being gutted. And (laughs) Wes had even said, you know, the prudence of five people is determining the fate of our movie. And so they ended up shooting at a community center that was that used to be an elementary school. And that's what you see in the film. But I think it's really interesting that they were just there were letters being sent to editors to mayors and they had all of this controversy controversy and people standing up against their movie because of what it possibly contained from the script what that's just ridiculous i mean it'd be perfectly honest it's a movie just i don't watch it if it really bothers you that much if it's destroying the youth of america don't watch it trust me your kids have already seen it so do it and they're watching way worse than this you ever been on pornhub Scary. <laughs> oh my. Far scarier than anything on you see. On that in this. note. I'm just saying. <laughs> so Jamie Kennedy, there's there's a moment when he's talking with our two killers and they're having a conversation and he does a Jerry Lewis impression when he says something about like, tell me something. Did you really put her liver in the mailbox? Mm-hmm. And I guess that was All Jamie Kennedy's idea. So his improv to do that imitation of Jerry Lewis to try to get some laughs. And obviously, it's it's a great moment in the film. But I love that he had some improv there, too. It really is. I mean, who who would have thought that a Jerry Lewis reference would be funny? I mean, even even seriously, when this even in 1996, that was still kind of dated. So that's that's a pretty old reference. So kudos for even coming up with it. Right. And kudos for being entertaining, Jamie Kennedy. Not usually. Are, so. <laughs> oh, that's mean. Ouch. Sorry. Randy as a character He's is favorite, one of my favorite char- characters. He's one of my favorite characters in the movie. And he has my favorite line in the whole franchise. So I'll what's tell the you line we, that's your favorite? I will tell you when we get to that movie. Okay. It's not in the first movie. It's in the second movie. Okay. So speaking of improvs, David Arquette improv the scene where Sid is opening the door to go to the ghost face mask when um, she's being somebody's chasing her through the house. I told you about where she tried to lock with the closet and then she runs back downstairs and she opens the door and he's just standing there with the mask held up to the door and they both scream at the same time like they're Pat. scared of each other. They both that scream was at the that, same that was time. all David Arquette. Really? Yeah. See, that's a fun fact. I did not know that, but that seems like something he'd do. He's a goofy guy. Just really funny. I love it. He's got a great attitude, it seems like. I don't know how much of that is Hollywood and how much of that is real, but every time I see him, he just seems like a guy you'd want to hang out with, have a beer with, you know? The dude literally sponsored an Airbnb where you pay $5 to go stay at the, the, the house from the film. See, I'm telling you. He seems like a nice dude. Seems like a nice dude. Seems like a good guy. They all do. Honestly, they all seem like good people. People on this cast, like they seem genuine. Nev Campbell, I've always loved her. She's, I'm sorry, I'm getting off top. Now I'm going to go on a Nev Campbell tirade, so I'll just <laughs> pull back. But she's So amazing. Matthew Lillard is in this movie very well known for his improvisation <laughs> because he does it a lot. He's great. He's, he great. Is He's a great shaggy too. You should have brought him back for that Scoob movie. Amen. That was bullshit because that dude that you got is not this guy. So yeah. just so you know, total side note, 
he should still be Shaggy. He's still the great, the greatest. He's such it. a talented actor. Super, oh, not, super talented. He's great on Bosch when he pops up. Yeah. Anyway, back to my, back to Matthew Lillard here. Yeah. So here, the moment towards the end when we have the reveal of who the killers are and there's all of these conversations and he gets stabbed by Billy and he <laughs> says, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> that was ad-libbed by Matthew. It was also improv when he said, my mom and dad are going to be so mad at me. <laughs> That's my favorite line in that movie. I uh, love it. My mom and dad are going to be so mad at me. I thought that was so good. <laughs> oh, my God. I was in tears the first time I saw that. I was in tears laughing. It's so and sh- funny. The, and you know what's so cool about that moment, right? Because you've got the two killers. They're... Their evil plan is coming into the forefront where we finally find out what's going on and you have him and it's kind of almost comedy, right? Like that's, that's comedy in the middle of this horrible situation. Many times if a horror movie did that, broke that kind of level of horror, Mm -hmm. the movie loses you. But I think he did so well. This is like a compliment to how well he did. He did so well in that part that he never lost me. Like, even, it just felt like that's Stu. That's the character. That's just who the guy is. And it's a horrible event. And yeah, it's funny, but it's horrifically funny. Like, he just, it's the way he delivered, all of it is the way he delivered it. And it just really played. And that's a moment where I think any other actor loses you if they make that joke. He He doesn't. I couldn't agree more. And I think it brings a level of humanity to him and youthfulness to his character because so far we've seen the vicious massacre of all of these people and it's it's them just for Stu more than anything it's him just I guess having fun and just doing something versus (laughs) Billy having an actual motive Mm -hmm. I mean kind of but that was a moment where you're like ah I remember they're freaking children like these are kids in high school that are doing this horrible horrible thing and that was the moment where it made you remember these are not adults these are kids and that makes it all the more messed up well they're wb slash cw kids which means they're 35 years old playing 15 or 16 true or 17. true true but i get what you're saying on screen they're supposed to be teenagers ski Ulrich was great too it, just a different kind of great i mean he really worked as the i want to be johnny depp murderer and <laughs> Him, him and Stu worked together, and it was so cool to have this duo of killers because nobody saw that coming. Like, so I can't even stress if you didn't see this when it opened how out of left field that was because nobody saw that coming. Everybody thought maybe, right. maybe Billy, maybe Stu. You know, they, there's a whole lot of back and forth with who the killer is, and you pick different people. Randy, he was the number one suspect on a lot of people's plates, and then it's both of them, and it kind of works. It really was pretty insane, and it worked just magically. Ah, that reminds me of another piece of trivia that I forgot to write down. But according to Ski Ulrich and also Wes Craven they and Kevin Williamson, they didn't actually outline specifically who, which killer was doing which murder. I mean, people can kind of figure it out based on, you know, like if – Skeet is the one who's there with Sydney, and she was just chased by Ghostface Mm -hmm. uh, two minutes prior. You know, like, then you know, okay, it was probably him. In the moments where he's in jail and there's a murder, then you you know that it wasn't him. Right. But they had not planned that out in the script. The movie (laughs) never planned any of those items out, so the two of them never even knew who was supposed to be murdering which person. That's kind of funny. You'd think that would have been kind of mapped out on a board somewhere. I thought so, too. Like, there's a lot of room for error in a situation like that had it not been handled, I think, by someone so talented as Wes Craven. I would agree with that. Absolutely. And also, can we just point out how cool a name Skeet is and how it's hard at this day and age to not so go, cool. Skeet, Skeet, Skeet! <laughs> <laughs> ah, motherfucker! <laughs> <laughs> ah, how great is and that? You got your own super song. super handsome. I mean, yeah. Right? He's a good looking dude. And he's always fun whenever he pops up in anything. And you're just like, ah, skeet, skeet, skeet. Yes. Or I am. That's I what I do. I love the man. Yeah. So a couple more improv things. Uh, Neff Campbell and Matthew Lillard actually had their own moment 
when he says to her, I always had a thing for you, Sid. And she says, in your dreams. And that moment works out really great. But both of them are ad-libbing at that moment. Hmm. I didn't know that one, but that works. Although I, was kind of, I always kind of thought, yeah, you, know, you didn't have a shot, Stu. I mean, really. Truly, we all knew he didn't. Mm-mm. But I think I, everybody was Stu at that moment because we were all in love with Nev. <laughs> Just saying. Fair it's enough. True. It's true. Some of us were in love with Nev and Skeet and Matthew Lillard. Uh, no, I'll just just uh, just Nev. Courtney Cox too. I mean, Courtney's <laughs> very pretty too. But she'd been around yeah. for a while, so that you know that love had subsided. Oh my <laughs> but god! But Nev was still new to the scene. And she's like, wow, she's so sweet. Oh. <laughs> Girl next door. So Matthew Lillard was obviously covered in the corn syrup, which was pretending to be blood and everything. Um, and the reason that the phone hit him in the head is because all of the corn syrup on Skeet's hand caused it to stick. So when he went to go toss it, it was not supposed to hit him in the head, but it works out so hilari- hilar- hilariously. God, I can't talk. When Apparently it does not. just bing him in the back of the head and he's like, hey, man. You hit me in the phone, <laughs> dick. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> uh, all right. Are you ready to get into the movie itself? No, I have so much. I still have trivia I haven't gotten to. Well, it's been 30 minutes. I mean, I don't know how much trivia we should go to. Okay. Let me just let me just say these. I'm just going to run through them real quick then. Okay. So 34 Elm Street was the address that was cut out of the film, unfortunately. But that I think that's a really nice homage again to other horror movies. They used real newscasters in Northern California for a realism effect when they had all of those interviews. Bob Weinstein, not not the other one, told Kevin Williamson that there was a 30-minute gap of murders and told him he didn't care how it happened, but he needed to off someone, and that's why they went for the principal. The stunt where Courtney Cox is driving the van towards the end of the movie was a stunt that went totally wrong. It was supposed to flip over, and it went right for the tree. Thankfully, the the stunt woman was not injured, and it ended up getting captured pretty great, so it all worked out, but could have been real bad. The scene where Sydney is trapped in the car and Ghostface has the keys was in an abandoned script of Kevin's from high school, so I think that's kind of fun that he pulled that back. Hmm. For Jamie Kennedy, when he is trying to walk with his limp, what he did as an actor to make it very real was put a giant rock in his shoe so he was stepping on a giant rock to cause the limp that sounds painful <laughs> skeet actually had open heart ah, skeet, skeet, skeet. surgery <laughs> when he was 10 years old and has a stainless steel wire that if you touch it is incredibly painful to him so when sydney pops out of the basement and stabs him with that umbrella it hits at the exact spot that it's not supposed to, despite all of the padding they put on him. So his reaction was 100% real, all the pain he felt. Well, that's what he gets for killing all those people. <laughs> Sorry, Ski. And then my last piece of trivia is Courtney Cox's end dialogue. When we close out, the sun is rising. They had the perfect time. That dialogue was given to her two minutes before they recorded, and they only had one or two takes to get it right. She did it perfectly on the first try. And it is one continuous shot that they're taking and moving upward as you start to see kind of the landscape of everything that's going on, and they close out the film. So that's props a great to her ending on that. Shot. Yeah, great mm-hmm. ending shot. And okay. I promise that's it. Okay, good. good. I'm I'm triviaed out. So everybody should uh, keep that in mind. But just remember the important one. Jason Voorhees was not the killer in the first Friday the 13th movie. It just wasn't. It's just, it's just it weird. It was his Why, mommy. You think? It was his mom. It was his mom. Come on. It was his mom. All right. So let me ask you, you say this is like one of your favorite movies of all time. Is it your favorite movie or one of? It is not my favorite movie it's overall favorite that still goes to movie. Boondock Saints. Yeah, but okay. this is definitely in my top three, and it is my favorite scary movie. Okay, so why specifically is Scream your favorite movie? Because there's a thousand slasher flicks out there. There's a billion horror movies. Why this one? What about this one? Well, there's a lot of reasons why I loved it. Obviously, all the homages to other ho- horror movies in the world that we know The real-life inspiration that they pulled from being the Gainesville Ripper, I think that's kind of cool that they pulled from that. But more than anything, 
beyond even the comedy and the awesome chemistry between the cast is Nev Campbell's character, Sydney Prescott, who I am a sucker for strong female characters. But I love those women who are not going to be beaten down. But, you know, they, they are not perfect. She's a flawed person. And I loved seeing her reality kind of being destroyed throughout the progress of this first film where she has this concept of who her mother was and they bring this really deep element to a horror movie that should just probably be a slasher film, but they start to chip away at what the reality of who her mom was and you see the impact on her and all of the elements that provide surprise and awe and shock just kind of contribute to a really great story that's happening. And this movie came out when you were a kid, right? I was obviously not a, a kid, wee but... little tot. Okay, a wee little tot. How did this movie influence your life, I guess? I mean, because usually whenever you have something that is a favorite or a top, it had some kind of impact on your life. Mm, that's an interesting question. It's. I think this was... Probably not the inspiration for my love of horror. I would probably give that to Poltergeist. But it certainly was one that drew me into feeling as as a, a little girl like women can fight back. And mm. especially when you watch scary movies and you're younger and a lot of those older scary movies, women are not the hero of the story. They're often killed. They're often, you know, being shamed for having sex and that's why they get murdered and their tits are out and everything. This was the this was an opposite reaction for women. And it gave you a character who you know, she had she had she could do whatever she want with her sexuality. She was trying to battle that I think obviously between who she was, who she thought her mom was and where she fits into that and once she realizes her mom was not a virgin by any means, according to everyone else, she starts to question things about herself. And so I don't know, I liked the the concept of your parent not being who you think they are, because I had that. So it gave me something to connect to. And it made me, I don't know, lean towards films where the woman is a hero, or she gets revenge, and definitely made me want to follow some of these actors who were so funny. Like Matthew Lillard, I wouldn't have followed his career had he not been in this. I wouldn't have cared. Hmm. That's interesting. Really, wouldn't it? Well, I mean, this really kind of popped him into the forefront of everybody's minds, too. So Matthew Lillard, I, w- I wish I think people give him more opportunities these days because I, I do think he's very talented. I feel like Nev Campbell just doesn't want to do as much as she used to. That's what it seems like. I mean, like she just kind of dialed it back in terms of her career, but she's always been an actress that I, not just because I think she's attractive I, I find, and I find her charming. I just, I think she's a good actress and she's fascinating to watch. David Arquette. She really is. Love David Arquette, Deputy Dewey. I mean, I feel like he's this, this <laughs> lovable goof who's also kind of heroic or at least wants to be, you know, he really wants to be, but he's also kind of, he's like, you know, your your little brother that is just try, he tries too hard all the time, but he always means well, and you know he means well, so you just want him to get through it. And uh, Gail Weathers is like the polar opposite of him because you know she's just this force of nature who is all about getting the I don't know about getting the truth necessarily, but getting it out there. She wants to get the scoop for sure. I think she, you know as the movies go on, she becomes more and more concerned with actually the truth. But it's just like, this is one of those movies where it's perfectly cast across the board. And, you know, you've already talked about a, a lot of the reasons why I love the movie. But one thing that I don't think it's talked about enough is the surprise of killing Drew Barrymore off. You know, oh, yeah. In the very beginning, an iconic actress. Yes. I mean, at, at that time, Drew Barrymore was extremely popular. She was somebody you would expect to be the star of this movie. And so you went into it and you got that opening. And of course, I think everybody probably thought she's going to get away from this guy. Like, this is just the opening. Definitely. You know, it was just absolutely brutal the way way that she died. And it was a big surprise. So, I mean, that's definitely the one that stood out to me. I already talked about the surprise of the the two killers. And honestly, just having a movie that really respected people that love horror movies. I feel like too often when we're talking about horror movies and being a fan... 
a lot of times up until that point, I felt like it was looked down upon, like savage. Why, why would you enjoy things like that? It was a very, it was more like a clicky thing. You know, it's a, it, it's a club. This movie really yeah. kind of, I think, took it to a different level and made it super popular with people that weren't necessarily horror fans. And that kind of opened and opened up the world to a lot of people to check out other horror movies. And, you know, it's always great to me when that happens and kind of widens the, the area of horror fans. Well, and it gave something for the people who were already horror fans and who were there because it's a scary movie, because you had the, all of the ties to other scary movies, but then you, to your point, you have something for the rest of the audience who maybe I'm not usually one to watch scary movies or a lot of gore and guts, but it's really funny. And, you know, maybe they get some of the references and they think that's kind of funny or whatever. That's where they started to tie them in and pull them in is using that as, as like the rope to say, all right, come on in. You know, it's like trying, it's like Pennywise trying to get a little kid to go down to the ditch. They just use comedy to do that. (laughs) It's a good point. Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, And also, I don't think enough can be said about how Wes Craven directed the movie and and made that, made it look so polished. You know, the great score, like all of this is a culmination effect, obviously great cast, good, great score, great, great script, surprise ending, but how he shot it, it just. It really felt like, you know, for Wes Craven, most of his career, he was trying to kind of segue into more mainstream fare, you know, less horror movies, more mainstream. He tried to get into that. And it just, other than a, an Oscar nomination for Meryl Streep, he didn't really have much success outside of that horror genre. And I feel like this finally gave him legitimacy in many respects among his peers. I know it did with, with a lot of fellow film critics. So, you know, a lot of that can be attributed to how well he shot it. He shot this like a glossy Hollywood spectacle as opposed to a cheaply made slasher flick. That matters. And and one of the most brilliant things that I find in this movie to reference back to breaking some of those horror cliches from Wes Craven is you have, I think it was Drew Barrymore's character. It may have been Nev's. It may have been both. But you're always expecting the killer to come from behind them when you're looking at their face. So you're like, oh, God, you know, if we don't see behind them, then inevitably they're just going to pop up and it's going to be a jump scare. Mm -hmm. And Wes Craven flipped that and said, no, screw it. We'll show the back so you can see there's nothing there. And then, you know, there's going to be an opportunity for you to see what's coming. And that's just as terrifying as... It's just showing up out of nowhere. He was he was so intentional about everything he did in this movie and and really in all of his movies from making sure that the house that they were in, which was a giant, beautiful house on, in a winery or on a winery or something, Drew Barrymore's house, and giving you all of the open windows to making her feel so exposed and, and in turn making audiences feel so exposed to this killer who's there and i just love everything that he does with it you know he he is brilliant with the halloween score being perfectly timed in the background in at towards the end of the movie where it it is following at the same pace that our movie we're watching is Mm -hmm. so the cast on screen is like no 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 don't go there he's coming he's coming and the killer is coming inside at the same time and so as you have Jamie Kennedy screaming at the TV not to do something or to do something. You have the audience saying, no, man, listen to yourself. <laughs> listen to yourself, dude. Look in the reflection or find something where you know what's, you know, you know better. It was also nice to have a slasher movie where the killer moved at a re- realistic pace. That was nice. Right. I, <laughs> you know, the whole I'm just going to kill you now pace I've never understood. Love Michael Myers movies. Love Jason movies. Why are you basically crawling? I don't understand how no one gets away from you. There should be a lot more. There should a lot more be a lot more people on Ellen talking about. I got away from this killer. This some bitch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there should be a lot more of that. But you know, whatever. So that's that's the first movie. I, I think that pretty much covers the first movie, wouldn't you say? I think so. Okay, let's talk about the series as a whole because then you go from Scream One, which I think is a, is a near perfect film in in many respects and you go into screen two 
And I will say that this is, I'm covering the base. I enjoy all four of the Scream films thus far. You know, the fifth one's coming out in January. Or the reboot, whatever you want to call it, because they're kind of bringing back the legacy characters, but they're kind of going with a whole new cast as well. We'll see what that entails, because they kind of did that with the fourth movie, and, you know, we'll see what happens. But Wes Craven directed the first four. Those are the ones we're talking about. In terms of Scream 2, uh, that really still kind of continues the scream condition of talk talking about movies from inside the movie. Only this time they're focused more on sequels, which is clever because it's the first sequel. They even have a movie in the movie based on the movie. So <laughs> wrap your head around that, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Stab. A little inception. It is a little bit and it's called stab and it's got Heather Graham in it, and she's playing, <laughs> she's playing Drew Barrymore playing Casey. I mean, it's just like this whole, inception thing like you said um and you've got jada pinkett smith and omar Epps. they get killed in in this movie which is sad because they're both very talented i kind of would have liked to have seen them in the movie more but what did you think of the second one you get um some more horror you get you get a lot more of the kind of um pop culture references the clever killer on the loose you get a little buffy you love buffy you get a little buffy in this one and you Hell also get yeah. you get dewey who gets stabbed and given a limp and w- which carries on right didn't they yeah it was in this, this movie that he got the limp and he almost died and i think they were gonna kill him or let him die and then they realized they couldn't do it or something in this movie but anyway so what did you think of scream 2 not my favorite but... really you didn't like scream 2 I, I'm not saying I didn't like it. I still liked it. It's just when you go from Scream 1 to Scream 2, there's a, I, I don't want to say there's a lack of originality, but there kind of is. Like you put Scream on such a high pedestal and then you go to Scream 2. And while it's still a good, enjoyable movie, like I'll watch all of the Scream movies and enjoy them. But in comparison, it's just like a, a step down for sure. Mm. I... <laughs> I found it really enjoyable for the majority. It, it's it's actually probably my favorite sequel of the Scream sequels, but it's probably also my least favorite murderers. Does that make sense? Like I just and hey, Timothy Oliphant is one of my favorite actors, man. Justified. I was gonna say, is this the reason? Is he it's, the reason you like this movie? But then you said you don't like the killers, no, no, no. and I'm like, now I'm confused. No, it, he's Justified is one of my favorite shows of all time. I've loved him in a lot of other things. Go is a great movie. Go find it. He's great in that. I love Timothy Oliphant. For whatever reason, I feel like he's trying too hard to be Randy in this, and it just yeah it doesn't work. Um, and Laurie Metcalf. I think she's a very talented actress. I never bought her as a psychotic at the end. That's probably my biggest strike against Scream 2, Scream 2 is I just don't think she plays. I think the character plays. I like the idea, but I always had a hard time. Like, so you never saw Billy Loomis's mom like a picture anywhere? I mean, <laughs> in the first one, they established that his parents divorced. I understand so, that, but, but Sydney re- recognized her right away, right? Like at the end of Scream 2, I think. Ooh, and it's, I'm, I'm fairly certain she did. But, Gail didn't. And I'm like, didn't you cover this? Yeah. How do you you, miss that? How do you miss this? You, you covered the whole case. That was always like, it just bugged me. But I, I also just, I just didn't like her as the killer. I just didn't. I bought her as crazy. Cause she definitely gave me crazy when she, and I get it. And I think it's fun to kind of play on the first movie where you have a woman who died because she didn't know that the mom was the killer and then you come to the second one and it's like, who's the killer? Um, are you going to get it right? And so there's some of that where I think it's fun and it, and it works for me. She didn't bother me in terms of being the killer or one of the killers. Well, this, she didn't work for me. But overall, I still en- enjoyed the movie. And it has my favorite line from the entire franchise. And What's that's, that line? That's from Jamie Kennedy. When he's he's basically he's on the phone with the killer. Once again, that's one of those things I'm like, how do you just kill him in the wide open? I don't, whatever. But it works. I enjoy it. But he's walking around and he's talking about, you'll never get the girl. And he's like, fuck you. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> I laugh every time I see it. I've re I've said that to people when I've gotten <laughs> in debates and arguments. Like I have quoted that way too many times. And I know it's it's two words that everybody says. It's how he delivered it that was perfect. I couldn't agree more. That's a <laughs> great moment. When he's screaming it, you can hear it in his voice like, I can get her if she just give me a chance. You know, I just you can just hear it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So I love that. Just keep him on the phone. What do you want me to say? I, I don't know. Just keep him talking. Come on, Gail. Uh, what are we doing? Hi. Look for somebody so, uh, with a cell phone. Yeah. What's your favorite scary movie? You'll never find me. Yeah, what do you care? Let them have their fun. So, uh, what's up? What's your favorite scary movie? Showgirls. Absolutely frightening. What's yours? Oh, Sorry. What's your problem? Wait, let me guess. A house in Sorority Row? The one that your blood? Splatter University? Graduation day? Final exam? Am I close? Closer than you think. Too slow, geek. Do you want to die? Is that the best you can do? Because Billy and Stu were much more original. That's me. Who's this? Who's this? Gail Weathers, author of the Woodsboro Murders. Who? Okay, he's got to be around here someplace. He's just playing with us. Yeah. White male suspect, nine o'clock. My clock or your clock? Your clock. Go around the back. Why are you even here, Randy? You'll never be the leading man. Fuck you! No matter how hard you try, you'll never be the hero, and you'll never, ever get the girl. Hey! Shit! Sorry. Hey, man. Wrong guy, dead boy. Uh, anything else on Scream 2 before we jump into Scream 3? No. Okay. Scream 3. This is probably my least favorite of the sequels. I still like it. Agreed. Uh, I, I really like how they bring, like, they go from making fun of sequels or not making fun of, but having a conversation on sequels to now we're into actual movie making. Like we just keep going more and more meta <laughs> with these movies. It, yes. Yes. The franchise does get super meta. <laughs> super meta. And I, and I really kind of enjoyed this and I, I liked how they killed off cotton because that was a surprise. Cause I just thought we just cleared him. There's no way they're going to kill him. And I right. did. Uh, I, once again, I feel like there's a little bit of a problem with Scott Foley as the killer. I don't think he's as compelling as he could be, but I also don't think he's bad. You know what I mean? Like, I wasn't distracted by him. I was yeah. just like, oh, okay. But the whole, you had a brother and the mother. Like, I just felt like this movie's trying too hard to tie it to Woodsboro. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But how did you feel about Scream 3? I completely agree with everything you just said. It's, I don't know. It felt like with Scream, we were... We've moved away from the cliches. We're trying to do things different. We're trying to surprise audiences without doing just shock stuff. And then comes Scream 3, and it's like, okay, come on. How cliche are we going to get? Like, she didn't know. She had a brother. He's all mad. Wah, wah, wah. Kill, kill, kill. And it's like... <laughs> I don't know. It just it rubbed me the wrong way. Don't get me wrong. Like I said before, I still will watch the movies and enjoy them. But this is my least favorite of the Scream franchise. My my, I do like like the ending, even though he's, you know, his monologue is ridiculous. But when Nev's <laughs> we're in, it's Nev, it's she's not Nev. Her name. The character's name is Sidney Prescott. I do know the difference, I promise. <laughs> but when, when he's just like throttling through his monologue and she's like, oh, well, you just get on with it. I'm just like, thank God. Thank God somebody in one of these movies said it. Let's just get to it. I ain't got time for you and your nonsense. I don't care about your story. Uh, I, I just, I love that. And of course, Dewey is always great. And the relationship with Gail, once again, was interesting. Yeah, the growth of their relationship. That was something to look forward to in the franchise to see yeah, built every what movie. would progress and yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I really dug that. And I did I did like how at least they're addressing Sydney Prescott's mental dilemma because she's go she's gone through so much. Like I get why she would be in the middle of nowhere and just completely off the grid and you know, trying to help people, not 911. I think I said 911 operator. That's not what it is. It's a 
like a grief counselor or something along those lines, I think is what she did. Um, but still, I mean, I understood what she was doing. <laughs> 911 operator, that would be, what's her name from, I know what you did last summer. Uh, well, not Halle Berry, but she also has a movie like that. Jennifer Love Hewitt. She's in Rescue, or like on Rescue 911 or whatever that show is. Ah, and she was in Party of Five with Nev Campbell. So I connected it. It all works. Do you want, do you want to go on to Scream 4? Well, real quick, I was just going to say, I think it's, I don't know how you feel about this, but originally the killer in Scream 3 was going to be Angelina Tyler. And her character was one of the actresses. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. So what she happened? was stabbed. She ended up getting stabbed by Roman. I don't know why it changed. I just know that she was originally supposed to be the killer, which I think made sense. But maybe they thought it was just too easy because they do give you a little bit of that. But so it would me, be like she had a sister instead of a brother kind of thing, I would guess. That's a, I don't know. I don't know all the details behind it. Well, I should if it makes try them feeling better. More. Emily Mortimer is probably a better actor, but. <laughs> just kidding. Scott, Scott Foley is a fine actor. It was just the, the role. And I just anybody don't think who he says the they're a fine actor is just no. Yeah. Sorry. You know who was fine? Patrick Dempsey. And that had a hair of his. He was great in that movie. Mm hmm. He had a delightful head of hair. But yeah, I, I did Parker Posey. I got to mention Parker Posey because she was fantastic. She really was. And <laughs> I don't know. She. <laughs> She made Courtney Cox feel the same way that we felt in the beginning of Scream. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Where you're just like, please shut up and go away. <laughs> you're so annoying. <laughs> but then by the end, you, you oh. kind of like you get a little soft spot for her. And th I think that's just kind of what it was replicating for us. And I for also, her. Uh, Patrick Warburton and Do Drop, that was Every time you said do drop, I just laughed. What's up, do drop? <laughs> Sorry, that's just the weird me <laughs> You're thing, such I guess. A dork. Yeah, it's a weird me thing. All right, so then we go to many years later, the franchise takes some time off, then they come back, and Kevin Williamson's writing again. He didn't write the third movie, he came back to write the fourth one. And now we've got like 10 years have passed. Sydney Prescott has written a book. She's back in Woodsboro, Murder Start Again. Now, this one is my favorite sequel. Of all of them, which is surprising. Really? For, for Yeah, it's surprising, right? Because it's the fourth movie. Mm -hmm. But I just thought it was very kind of clever how they did it because, you know, you, you have the the conclusion where the main character is related to her, which is insane right. to me, you know, that that would be the way that they would go. And she, you know, Emma Roberts is... Jill Roberts, she basically is is someone that is desperately starved for attention. And actually, I think her reasoning makes the most sense out of all the other murderers, except for Billy and Stu, because it feels like something someone from today's youth would think would get them popularity. Like, I really feel like that her motives are more timely now than they even were in 2011. When this came Definitely. Out. Mm -hmm. So what did you think about Scream 4? I surprisingly really enjoyed it. I don't know. I guess I haven't really thought about where I would rank it. it. It's definitely above three. I just don't know if I like it more than two or not. I think I need another rewatch of it to, to determine. But I do like that Jill Roberts character or that her character was the one of the murderers. I started to feel like... Maybe we're just going to, they're finally done with the, the double killings. Yeah, I was hoping for that too. It was kind of disappointing. And then it's her, her like secret boyfriend guy who's part of it. And I, that's what I didn't like. I totally agree with that. I 100% I wish that wasn't the case. It was. Um, okay. And you basically got a guy who's similar to, Timothy Oliphant's character, who's also similar to Randy's character. So basically, okay, so people that like movies are going to always be involved in killing. I don't like that. But um, I, I like Jill Roberts as a character. I really like that play on the character. That really mm -hmm. worked for me a lot. And then, you know, Hayden Penetary's in it. So she was great. <laughs> it's a big fan of hers. I'm still hoping she survives for the new one. But it was nice to see the gang all back, but they were also kind of brought in this whole new cast of kids, which sounds like what they're doing with the new movie. 
Right. It's just for me, like this is the sequel that flowed the best, probably because it separated itself. And at the end, I legitimately thought for the first time in any of the sequels that there was a real chance Sidney Prescott could die. Mm hmm. Yeah. And well, and I wonder, is that going to happen in the new one? They have to kill one of the originals, right? Like they have to. I would think so by now. I mean, when you get to number five, somebody's got to die. If you kill Sydney, though, there's a good chance I never watch five again. <laughs> I'll be honest. That's true. I, I could probably get behind Gale or uh, Dewey, maybe. Oh, man. Dewey would be a heartbreaker, oh, though. Dewey would break my heart. Which or is if why... they both died. Oh. <sighs> that would crush me a little bit. You know, they made if it he so died far. to save someone else, like that would be an honorable death I could get behind. Yeah, you can't this at this stage. You have to give them a respectful. If you're going to kill them, it better mm-hmm. be respectful in some way. You know, I don't know how you do it, but it better be. Uh, I just, I just don't want Sydney Prescott to die because then I kind of feel like you negate all the trauma she's went through in the last few movies. You know, I just and the re- survival of her. Yeah, I think he kind of slapped the fans a little bit. I would be more happy if they were just investigating the case, and maybe they aren't even. The focal points. You know, I don't mind them being mm. in the background and not being in mortal danger. <laughs> I'm okay with that. Let me just say to our guest, Sidney Prescott, it's an honor. <laughs> Beyond Jamie Lee Curtis, forget Linda Blair. I mean, this is the ultimate. Thanks. I, I guess. Um, this, you film your entire high school experience and what, post it on the net? Everybody will be doing it someday, Sid. It's kind of the one component the killer is missing. Wait, what do you mean? Well, if you want to be the new, new version, the killer should be filming the murders. It's like the natural next step in a psycho slasher innovation. I mean, you film them all real time, and then before you get caught, you upload them into cyberspace. Making your art as immortal as you. Not Not to implicate him. him. So who do you think is behind the murders? Well, it's a stab fanatic, clearly. Working on less of a shriekwell and, and more of a scream make. Copyrighted terms, by the way. Because all there are now are remakes. Only horror of the studio's green light. I mean, there are still rules, but the rules have changed. The unexpected is the new cliche. Yeah, you gotta have an opening sequence that blows the doors off, dial up some flashy music video direction, and the kill's gotta be way more extreme. Modern audiences get savvy to the rules of the originals. So the reversals become the new standard. In fact, the only surefire way to survive a modern horror movie? You pretty much have to be gay. <laughs> so why are you so sure that the killer's working by the rules of a horror remake? Well, the original stab structure is pretty apparent. Yeah, two kids killed in a house when their parents are away. And then the school's hot chick savaged beyond recognition. We all know where it goes from there. A party. Exactly. A party. Guaranteed third act main cast bloodbath. Fingers crossed on some nudity for a change. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so do you know of a party that's happening tonight? Well, there's Stabathon. Stabathon? Uh, it's a movie marathon. All seven stabs back to back. We do it every year. And it's tonight? There's a killer out there patterning his murders after the original movie. I know. It's pretty wild. Well, you have to call it off. Um, okay. I mean, it's Friday. I'm sure we're not the only party that's going on in Woodsboro. Okay, where is this circle jerk going to take place? So who's ready for this Q&A? No, no. I really want the location. You know, it's kind of an underground thing. Email invites, pretty secret. <laughs> but you're not going to tell me? Really? We're working together. Remember? So you ready for that Q&A? <laughs> Fuck you. Let's go. That was awesome. But four, I'm sorry, back to four. I, I thought the collection of kids that they had together were really clever, how they assembled the whole plot, even though I'm sure far fetched as always was interesting. I, I thought, you know, it was all kind of staged well. And I, part of me, there's a part of me where at the end, if you go back to the end, she thinks she's killed Sydney and she's accomplished this where she's going to be famous because, you know, she basically fended off the killer herself. And though Sydney died, she lived because now she gets to be the final girl, right? That was her whole plot is now she gets to be the right. final girl. Part of me thought, wow, wouldn't it be fantastic if that stuck, if that's the ending they went with? And part of me wishes they had done it because that would have been a real interesting way to turn the movie on a, on, her, on its head. 
What do you think about that? Where Sydney actually does die and she gets away with it. Oh, man. I don't know. I I don't know that I'd want her to die just so we can get a, a, like another monster born out of it. But at the same time, it could it could work and it would create this lingering unknown for the audience of what world are Gail and Dewey and all of them living in now, you know, unbeknownst to them, this cousin murdered her. And yeah, I mean, I guess they did know. So I don't think she could get away with it completely. Well, they only figured it out at the end, though. I mean, that's so, true. So you're saying if they get if it's rewound a little bit before that and she dies before and she says it was Ghostface. Yeah. Nobody we, really questions her. Right. Because we've already we already know at that point. I mean, and then we just like it ends on where if it ended where the cameras are at the very end of the movie, where it's like the reporting already because they don't have all the facts about Sydney uncovering who the killer was. If they just re- ended on that, like that could have been a really crazy ending that I think could have shook, shook up the franchise and made it something new. You know, I get that the safe play is make sure Sydney lives. And I, don't get me fan, wrong. I'm a fan. I just said I don't want Sydney to die. But in the past, movie, I think now it's too late. I think you missed your window. I think it would have worked in that movie and it could have been something really cool. Horrible, sure, for fans, but also kind of cool because how many movies that would be turning the franchise on its head? The killer gets away with it? Holy shit. Yeah, opposite to the beginning where you think that the killer of her mom's murder is put away. Exactly. Complete opposite. And it's and playing on expectations. That. That's what the first movie did so well, is it played on expectations. You know, it went against, it subverted what you expected. If the fourth Mm -hmm. one would have done that, if it would have ended on that note, I think it really would have been like a complete series, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah, no, I agree. And I do, to your point, I really do like in this movie that they make it so uncomfortably real, where I could also definitely see, especially someone in the family who doesn't really know Sydney and they they see her getting all this fame and they see all the fame that came from the people who tried to hurt her and they're just tired of it and they're big nerds who like horror stuff and they're like all right we can do this like let's just do it let's let's be Billy and Stu and trying to replicate that like it that part does definitely work where I can see two kids coming together to try to be like we can do it too. I want that fame. I want people to notice me. Doesn't it just sound like something would happen today? It really does to me. I mean, it just feels like, I mean, Is, it just, that's scary. I feel like that's scary. It's true, though. I mean, I just look on Facebook reels or Instagram stories or all it is are thousands of people or TikTok, thousands of people spending their day trying to be famous. That's all they do. That mm-hmm. is their number one goal is to do whatever it takes to be famous. I'm going to fall off a building. I'm going to jackass style, whatever it is. I'm going to do anything <laughs> I can to be famous. I thought that that ending for me was ahead of its time. I think it's very relevant today. It's the only sequel that really, really, really held up plot wise, in my opinion, even though I know it sounds insane, yeah. but is it really? Look at today. Well, I'm sold. I could totally see some kid off in me so they could get famous. Absolutely. <laughs> well, stay away from those crazy ones. That's why I don't talk to people. That's why I just stay away <laughs> from everyone. Anything more you want to say on Scream? Otherwise, I think it's time for us to... We've talked about every single one of the movies, especially the first one. Is there anything you haven't talked about? The series or Well, the I film? feel like we should talk about our expectations or hopes from the new one. Ooh. Yeah, let's get ahead of the game, right? Um, I don't know what I want yet. I, I, I know that I don't want just another rehashing of 4, because 4 already kind of felt like what the new one looks like. You know what I mean? It, it, are, it already kind of looks like, okay, we've got a new cast of young people. You're bringing the old, I'm calling them legacy characters. You're bringing the originals back, the OGs. So it's going to be very similar to that. But I can't imagine that that's going to be the the way that it's going to play because the directors, Matt Bettinelli, Bettinelli Olfen and Tyler Gillett, I hope I said that right, um, they did Ready or Not. Great movie. Love that movie. And I feel like they obviously have something in mind because I know Nev Campbell 
was really kind of against doing anything without Wes Craven because Wes Craven's passed away and she came back to do this. So in my opinion, it sounds like they really have something that spoke to her and that also honors Wes Craven. So I don't know what that could be though. What do you want? I don't know. I, and I, and I think it has to be something unique and clever and still, it can't be anything that they believe they being the legacy actors would be, believe would be offensive to Wes Craven and his legacy because, you know, he built this, he made this. Um, And so I am looking forward to, based on what I've seen in the trailer, I'm looking forward to their play on today's technology, like the opening in the trailer where the locks are being played with. Oh, all the Digitally? smart devices. Yeah, that yeah, looks like that's yeah. that's great. I I love seeing stuff like that. So if they can expand the universe and not do anything to take away from or deteriorate any of the good stuff that's happened in the Scream franchise, and they just work to, I think to your point, I I don't know that I want to see any of the characters, any of the legacy characters, being too instrumental to the film because then I worry if they kill them and is it going to be honorable if they kill them and how am I going to feel about that? And just all of go that, out like but- a samurai, <laughs> like a real honorable <laughs> death. Oh, yo, we fight to the death. But at the same time, it, it also feels like somebody has got to go. If you're just going to keep doing this, somebody has got to go. But I also, I don't know. I'm conflicted. Cause I also don't want them to just kill someone because it's movie five and somebody has got to go. You know what I mean? It's complicated. I- it's it's tricky because I'm I really don't want any of the original cast to go. Like I really don't. At this right. point, I feel like my mind has already kind of accepted they live and they've went off on their journeys and they're doing other things. And I don't want that tarnished. I would much rather have them be the Scooby Doo gang and they're just which would be great. Then you can get Matthew Matthew Willard back as Heck Shaggy. Yeah, that would be real <laughs> awkward though. I like, don't care. gosh, you look Figure so familiar. Figure Ooh. it out. We didn't tell you, but Stu actually survived. He's actually been in prison this whole time. We just <laughs> never, ever mentioned it. And I mean, then yeah. he got his degree in criminal justice while he was in prison, and he's reformed, and now he, he's a private investigator. Or he had a twin brother named Gru. And <laughs> we never Gru talked or about Groot. Either way, we'll go we'll go Gru is what I said. <laughs> He's got this twin brother named Gru, and this whole time we never talked about him because it was so tragic to have this twin no, I don't want a twin brother. Uh but yeah, it's it's kind of crazy <laughs> how many ways this can go. I mean, I just want something interesting. I just want it to be something it's gotta feel like scream, but I also think at this point you also have to make it feel like it's a movie that's subverting our expectations but i also expect one of the original cast to die so honestly go against my expectations make sure they all live and then you'll also feel satisfied at the same time i just i i really I, like i said i'm sincere about that i think in four it would have worked if you killed sydney and ended on that yes it could it would have been a dour note but in the same token i feel like then it would have been a full circle for the entire franchise in many respects now you're at a fifth totally. movie it's a reboot of sorts. I, I just, now I have a whole lifetime, basically, I mean, 25 years is a long time to have in my mind where those characters went. It's too late to kill them, in my opinion, unless you do it, like you said, mm. a really honorable death. I mean, they got to save somebody or a bunch of people for that to work. They save the Marvel Cinematic Universe. <laughs> How the hell do you work that in? All right. Well, I don't know. I'm just saying something real extreme. I know nobody wants to ask this question, but is the Weinstein name off of this now? I mean, how does that work? <laughs> I, I doubt it. I, I doubt so. it. But it sounds like Harvey wasn't as invested as Bob. Right. But I hope I, nobody wants to see that name. <laughs> nobody no. Bury it at the end credits is like the very last thing you see. Right? I don't want to see it anywhere. <laughs> don't Don't make me. You know, think about that. Uh, last question in terms of the new one. If it's more than one killer, will you be irritated? I don't know. I guess it depends on how clever it is. I would really like them to stop trying to reinvent that wheel that they invented. <laughs> like, just leave it alone. <laughs> yeah. The wheel the wheel has moved on. It's, it's spun. We're done with it. I'm with you. Stop spinning that wheel. It's got to be one killer. One killer. Or... 
I don't know, start with one series of murders and end with a different murderer later on, years later, do a time jump. I don't know what the hell you do, but <laughs> I just don't want that. Okay. Anything else on screen, Amanda? This is a, it's been a great conversation. It's been fun to kind of revisit that whole series and uh, look forward to seeing the new one, which is coming out. Oh my God. So In soon. January. Are you excited for that? Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm still, of course, I'm going to see it. So I wish I would be much more excited, though, had I won that Airbnb trip for $5. <laughs> I'm sure. But you'll get to see this January 14th, 2022. And I wish it was coming out like on Halloween or Christmas like the originals. Mm -hmm. But I, I feel like January is always a dumping ground for movies. I don't like that. But, you know, yeah. Bad Boys 2 came out in January. It was a huge hit. So fingers crossed. Either way, we'll be back to talk about Scream, I'm sure. Oh, we're definitely going to come back and talk about Scream. And they called <laughs> it just Scream, not Scream 5, because they don't want you thinking it's the fifth one, even though they have characters from four other movies in it. Okay. <laughs> it's a reboot. It's the same name. Couldn't you call it Scream Again? Or <laughs> Scream Louder? Something? Scream Duh. Scream the. <laughs> there you go. Something that isn't just the exact same title. Yeah, I do not like when movies, especially when there's a franchise, they use the same name. It's please don't like let's not like Halloween. Why did you make the 2018 Halloween also Halloween? Because then you have to specify the year at all times. Like, oh, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the original or oh, I'm not talking about the original. I'm talking about the remake. Do not get me started on all those movies and trying to uh, just recently I watched Halloween two and Halloween H two O and the people I'm watching with, I'm trying to explain to them how these don't count in the new movies. Like, well, how do, how do they not count? <laughs> they don't count. What about all the other they movies? Just none, of that, don't. none of them count. Only the first movie counts. So you're saying they made like 10 other movies. None of those count. Yeah. They don't count. That's dumb. No, it really works. Oh, well, what's different? Well, Lori Strode's in the new ones. Well, she was in two and H two O. Yeah, but this time she has a daughter. Well, she had a son, but it's a daughter now. Okay. <laughs> you have a lot of feelings about this. I, I do have a lot of feelings about it. I do. Okay, well, that's going to do it for this episode. So thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks for your support. And just let us know what your favorite scary movie is. -ha 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 -ha. That was not terrifying. My mom no, and dad are no. going to be so mad at me. <laughs>